Friends, we are continuing with the last plenary and uh, take your seat. And uh, what a wonderful panel, the American dream. I would like to thank um, Wendy Dan and the two senators. I would like to thank everybody here in the room. I think you are the real stars. You brought up your dreams, your ideas to the table as we try to envision the future and shape the future. I think that it's a, a very, a lot of uh, emotional moments at this summit, starting on Saturday with a session on SDGs, later on the legacy of um, Nelson Mandela, and also when uh, El Baradé, Dr. El Baradé, talked about uh, his vision for the future. Uh, a very gloomy state of the world. We see a lot of um, risks out there, geopolitical risk, but also social risk. We mentioned populism before, uh, possible trade wars, but still there's a lot of hope in the room, a lot of optimism, how we can overcome all those challenges. We had a lot of sessions actually on technology, uh, technology enabling us, augmenting us, and helping us to realize our visions. What we will do in the next hour or so is to summarize this Harassis Global Meeting and eventually coming up with a vision for the future and to see how we can translate your ideas, your vision, into a plan to shape the future. Maybe before we start, and let me briefly introduce this wonderful panel here, Rajiv Kohl, who will be acting as rapporteur. Rajiv, um, you get your applause, uh, exactly. <laughs> it's showtime. Rajiv is based in Kolkata. He's the chairman of NICO, one of the largest conglomerates in uh, West Bengal, in um, uh, eastern part of India. He's very much into theme parks, and uh, you work also with a lot of kids. I think uh, youth and uh, empowering youth is uh, one of your main topics, but you're also in engineering, so many different areas you're in. Lila, Lila Tretikov uh, has been uh, the president and CEO of Wikimedia, the um, uh, holding company of Wikipedia, as you all know, and she's very much into um, the Terawatt Initiative which was born with uh, the Paris Accord on climate change some two years ago, and you will tell us a little bit later about that. Deborah Wynne-Smith is heading the US Council on Competitiveness. A very seasoned politician, as you, Deborah, have been also uh, involved with um, US politics for many, many years as an undersecretary in different positions. So we'll hear from the three of you just in a minute, but before we start, Maybe I would like to collect some ideas from you. Not questions, maybe just uh, very quick comments, and uh, would like to hear your key takeaways and uh, what would you like to see as the main outcome of the summit. We've got microphones here, and uh, we can just take a few quick uh, comments and uh, maybe proposals. Who's the first one? OK, we've got one over here, of course. <laughs> Always maybe identify yourself and see where you come from, and um, we have one here, exactly. Yes, my name is Zimmermann, I'm uh, from Germany, and uh, my day job is as a journalist, and uh, there are many takeaways, actually, but one, one question is, could we organize a massive drive for public infrastructure investment, particularly in renewable energy, um, through um, issuing green bonds that are sovereign-backed. Okay, good point, very good point. Something very concrete. I think just uh, one row up. Yes, please. Oh, thank you. Actually, I was reading and distracted when you gave us our instructions on what we're uh, commenting on, but I just want to say that this has been a very instructive, very interesting uh, meeting. I think for everyone that I've talked to. Um, I think uh, the important thing for me is that we, my name is Joe Garski, I'm from the United States, but I'm living in Italy. Um, I think the important thing for me and probably for many other participants is that we don't just talk, but that we are compelled in some way to take action and to carry our new knowledge, our new insight, and to employ it in some useful way uh, in the world. We thank you, uh, Dr. Richter, for your 
efforts. Very enlightening. Thank you. Yes, thank, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> uh, yes, please. Henry. Hi, uh, Henry from USA, and I'm a CEO of Suntry Inc. Uh, what I'd like to, uh, first of all, it was a great event, uh, great topics about technology, robotics, AI, blockchain, etc. My actual proposal is how do we now be able to use technology to create prosperity in the majority of the world? And in order for, for anywhere, all the developing countries that are currently struggling, uh, and that's, I think that's an issue that's really important to empower everybody through technology that we have today that we did not have 10 years ago. Thank you. Thanks, Henry. And you moderated a fascinating panel on blockchain, which uh, really made the news. <laughs> yes, please. Hi, Frank. So I think one interesting, uh, I'm Pranjal from uh, India. I think a very exciting uh, thing and notice uh, at, in the deliberations is that two fundamental transformations which are happening uh, led A by fourth industrial revolution and B is climate change. And I found that it's very exciting that both can help each other. The industrial revolution based on technology platforms can now make sure that climate change is, is addressed and attacked in the most positive way possible. So I think that's a theme which uh, uh, needs to be um, enhanced, improved, and, and dwelt upon. Thank you, Francho. Maybe one more comment. Yes, please. Oh, we have a few more hands. <laughs> Uh, I think one of the takeaways is that the changes are transformational more than incremental because of the technology. The technology is forcing us to live in a more interconnected world, and it's not a question of willing or not willing. There is no more choice. We have to work in a new environment where everybody is interconnected, and because the regulatory is always behind the technology, there is a need to advance the reflection on the laws and on the regulatory in order to catch up with the technology. And I think here, Horasis could perhaps create small working groups with people interdisciplinary to try and see how we meet that gap between the fast evolving technology and the slower evolving regulatory framework. Very good point. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Sunny Leung from United Kingdom. If the future lies with our young people, and 60% of the population in the world is under the age of 30, and now the African continent is even much lower, I would like to see and hear uh, from the youth, the young people of today, and sadly, some of the panels, we don't really have the youth representation, so perhaps in future meetings, we can actually invite the young people to sort of hear what they have got to say. Thank you. Thank you. Is there any immediate oh, yeah. comment maybe from, you know, the younger crowd here in the room? <laughs> yes. Uh, yes, Jouko Ahvenainen, working especially with FinTech. Uh, yeah, I, I have liked also many discussions and it has been really excellent. Actually, one topic I have thought quite a lot it is linked to fintech, blockchain, but many areas in internet business also is linked to globalization. Because I feel that there are now totally two levels of globalization. Something what is happening between governments and big companies, and then what I call micro-level globalization, how comp many small companies just go global immediately. People are doing business uh, globally. They don't care about any official rules and that kind of things. And I, I think that it's one topic to, uh, to clarify more that how much this kind of micro-level globalization is happening. Thank you. We have two last quick comments. Uh, one here, Robert, and then one last comment here. Yeah, Please. thank you, Robert Kahn from the US. One of the things that I've taken away from this few days is the importance in everything we've talked about and everything we're trying to do, the, the concept of human dignity and how we um, embed that in the new technologies, how we embed that in our religious values, how we embed that in our politics. It was so essential, and uh, thank you for bringing that up in so many of the, Thanks, the sessions. Robert. Thank you. Please. Yeah, I, th I think my, my name is Vilborg. I'm coming from Iceland. Um, I think what we have been discussing in this forum is really everything comes into education. It's really about education. How can we help schools in the world 
and nations to improve education, because that's where the future lies. We should uh, Good point. put more focus on that. Good point. We come back uh, to, you know, later on with a few more comments. Let's now turn to the panel. Rachif, as a rapporteur, would you like to start? Sure. Uh, do you want me to walk around? Or do you uh, want me to please sit? be free. Yeah, yeah. We can both walk around, try walking dance around. around. I've <laughs> never tried that before. <laughs> <laughs> like the professors. Yeah, exactly. Right, thank exactly. You. <laughs> well, uh, Frank, I must say that uh, a lot of the points uh, as a rapporteur, which came up in the many sessions, and I must thank your colleague Ennis, who's been, uh, you know, got 24 young people making notes, and I've got feedback from many of them. That, there you are, there you are. Can you stand up so we'll give you a hand? The, the <laughs> silent workers behind the scene. That's Ennis, right? So uh, they gave me a lot of feedback, plus I had attended a few sessions and I made some notes, uh, and a uh, lot of them have been actually brought up because you changed the style suddenly. You went to the Nick Gowing style, which is very useful <laughs> and good. Uh, so, but let me very quickly you know, go over the points, right? Uh, the main 10 main takeaways that I sort of got in terms of feedback, firstly, that the future has a habit of showing up earlier than expected as cycle times due to innovation and development are rapidly shrinking. That's one. Second, that the future has different promises as also threats for different regions. For example, in aging Europe and Japan, it's all about preserving their future. In Asia and Africa, there is growth driven by the aspirations of the young. And I totally agree that there should be a panel perhaps next time where you just have the youth, you know, the aspirational youth from all over the world. Uh, when you come to the US, we've just had a great panel uh, on the US, but I think the general feeling was, um, and what's, what's happening with Trump? How is America going? Where is it going? And will Trump come again? And we are not going to know where America will keep heading. That was kind of a, the, the, uh, in the closed door, that was the kind of conversation. Then the future of our planet and people is threatened by the rapid depletion of nature's materials, pollution of land, water, and air. Simultaneously, the future of society and nations is threatened by conflicts. The struggle for peace and prosperity is getting even more complicated. However, there was optimism that it's all going to be winnable. Fourth, what is needed and understood today by most nations is that sustainable and inclusive development is the need of the hour. Thus, multilateral institutions need to be preserved and indeed given more teeth because they are getting weaker. Governance and leadership, be it political or in business, needs to be made more ethical and transparent. And the leaders have to really lead by example themselves, both in business as also the political sphere. The future is one of very rapid change in an ever-increasing digitalized world where IoT, artificial intelligence, robotics, and blockchains are impacting people the world over. And disruption is causing traditional industries to sort of close down or, or rearrange themselves and downsize. But startups are growing exponentially, and they are creating the new jobs of today and tomorrow. Seventh, the urgent need for education and skill development is extremely important, and this subject came in many, many of the panels, all right? In this era of fourth resolution, everybody needs to be reoriented, other than the, the young ones, who are perhaps not in large enough a number here today. The future of protectionism was discussed at many sessions as well, and there was an overwhelming view that uh, it is bad. Protectionism is bad. 
for both for global growth and for the people living in the protectionist countries because there will be an inflation and a higher cost of living. The key to a better future, and this is the ninth and last point, is the key to a better future is sustaining what is available and creating what is still needed. There is an urgency to chart a roadmap for transition, for transition, sorry, to a peaceful, prosperous, healthy, and sustainable future. And finally, I'd like to say, and that's my comment, that I am very optimistic of the future, and I do hope all of you are as well. Can we have a show of hands? How many are optimistic for the future? <laughs> and how many are not? Please do come to Kashkais again. Yeah, Frank? <laughs> <laughs> Thank Wonderful you. Wonderful summary. <laughs> Wonderful summary, Ratsuifu. <laughs> I think almost like a Kashkai's declaration, right? So yeah. like, you know, the nine points, and yeah. uh, I, I wonder why not 10, actually. Yes. <laughs> well, the 10th was, uh, you know, I mean, I think I ran out of time when I was noting them, and she gave me far too many points, so to distill <laughs> them, it was kind of difficult. <laughs> Great. Deborah, would you like to continue? Thank you. Well, let me echo congratulations on the meeting, Frank. Um, I think if you look at the program, from the plenaries to the breakout sessions, Really, almost every important issue was addressed. And also, we had the benefit of looking around the world in the geographical components as well. Um, I was very pleased to participate in the lunch on Portugal and to see the tremendous progress in Portugal You know, coming out of the economic crisis. I mean, I learned that 48% of the engineers in Portugal are women. Um, I'm involved in a very exciting nanomaterials uh, company, and it turns out one of their big suppliers is in Portugal. So it's interesting to see how Portugal's navigating this future. So I, I, I was very pleased that we had that opportunity. So a couple thoughts here, and then I wanted to share some ideas of, of looking past as prologue to the future. Uh, you know, if there's one word that emerged, I think, in virtually all the discussions is transformation. And, you know, Transformation is a complex process. It's a muddy process. You know, when you're transforming something, you really know there's a beginning. You're not sure exactly when it started, and you're certainly not sure about when the transformation is completed. So that theme of transformation, um, you know, pervaded all the discussions. Another theme, and I was very, very pleased about this. I'm personally very much a proponent of this and talking a lot about it, is not just leadership, it's ethical leadership. And I think in the discussions, you know, we touched upon some universal issues, and I want to come back to those, but ethical leadership was another um, very important uh, concept that emerged in the discussions. And then the third uh, area that I think is very significant in all the discussions is that we have to and we are creating new connected communities across every sphere of life. And of course, one of the communities is here, the Horatius Group. So, you know, there was a lot of uh, deep presentations on the technological transformations. Uh, I, I will just say very quickly that it's not just the digital, the biotech, and the nano, and the cognitive revolutions. It's the fact that they're converging, and they're colliding, and they're not just disrupting, but they're enabling products and services that are so uh, unpredictable, and they're moving at such a fast pace that it has really created the consternation and many of the uh, negative uh, issues we see around the world in terms of adjustment to this. And this is always true when human beings transverse between two ages of development. You know, we've clearly left the 20th century model of production and services, and we're in the 21st model. And so I want to talk a little bit about that. But I love the topic, inspiring the future, because with all the talk of AI and what it's going to do and the rise of robots and automation, what we've been doing here at Horasis is absolutely uniquely human. I don't think there's any other creature that thinks about the future. Just the ability to have conceptual thought and to dream and imagine and to try to understand 
what could be a future or alternative state is profoundly human, and I feel very optimistic and confident that we will never be able to have you know, AI systems that can be um, really co-creating the future. So that, that's a very interesting component as well. Um, I thought, you know, interesting human attributes and uniquely characteristic behaviors also permeated some of the discussions. So this is, I don't want you to think this is trivia, but it's worth mentioning some of these things. What are some of these qualities in our abstract thought and our behaviors? You know, I talked about imagination. We obviously start with instinct. But there's emotion, there's concern, there's selfishness, there's altruism, there's fear, there's cruelty, there's generosity, there's hate, there's distrust, there's insecurity, there's empathy, and there's this fundamental human drive to create. And that is another uniquely valuable asset. And that, again, permeated the discussions. So I thought what might be a little interesting is um, to really go back a little bit in history, because being an archaeologist, I truly believe past is prologue to the future. So I thought I would just quickly share with everyone an example of a very early civilization that I believe is a prototype of the 21st century conceptual economy. And I want to share with you what are the characteristics of such a civilization, and how is it relevant to us in this transformation? So I'm going to take us back to uh, about 2000 BC, to the beginning of the Bronze Age Aegean civilization in Minoan Crete, which, in my view, was the first globalized civilization in the entire Mediterranean world. So what were some of the things that were very important in that civilization? One, and these again, think of them going to the future. One was a desire to understand the world in which they lived and to discover new things about the world, and two, to develop and master new tools, earliest science and technology. And you see that, of course, in the Egyptians and others. Another example that's very, very important is that a recognition in how they lived that artists were just as important as engineers. And they were great fusion thinkers, how they created their architecture, their art, their products. And a third, very important, is that they were outward looking. They were not inward looking. They really developed most of the trading networks. You see their goods reaching everything from Egypt, the Levant, and even farther. And they were importers of luxury items, new ideas, new skills. So they were outward looking, not inward. They were not isolationists. They also valued skills and artistry. And in their design, they were sustainable. First air conditioning systems in the world were in the Minoan palaces. How they treated the planet. All of these things really capture what we talked a lot about here, people, purpose, and our planet. So this is something we can learn from in the past. And the final point that I want to mention about the Minoans, and this is something that I do think we need a lot of work to do on throughout the world, is this society and culture valued women. Women were involved in every component of their society. They were priestesses, they were rulers, they were artists, they were depicted in all the art. Very, very powerful. I will posit to you there's no great civilization in the continuum of our development that does not value and elevate and incorporate the role of women. So one of the things projecting into the future, I will say that one of the most transformational realities will be not just including women, gender parity, it's the rise of women. Women are going to have a very, very important role in navigating these great transformations. And those countries and cultures and societies who don't get with the program vis-a-vis -vis women, they're going to be left behind. They are truly going to be left behind. And that is something that I think this group and others have to deal with. So coming forward, a few things I wanted to highlight about both conventional wisdom and you know 
perhaps a different way of looking at some things. So um, we had a number of views where there were some people who thought that a lot of the solutions to these big global challenges are going to come from government. Government's going to do the top-down sort of solution and development of this versus others who felt we have to empower the private sector, unleash their creativity, their talent, their resources, and then others who thought it's a combination of the two. I personally think it is a combination of the two, but at the end of the day, it's people that create, people who produce, and people, again, have to operate in a system in which they have power and opportunity to contribute. So the role of the private sector in this time of transformation, we need to look at, yes, how we've done things in the past, but also how we go to the future. Now, there were two conflicting paths we heard about at Horace Summit, and we saw this in comments and in different parts of the world. So I will call these two paths countries, thinkers, whatever, that are blockers and those that are builders. And the blockers, of course, are protecting the past, they're trying to preserve whatever the status quo is. They're protecting the current rent seekers, the established businesses, the monopolies, the elites. And it's about preservation, not moving. And then you see the builders that are saying, we have an unknown future, but we want to be out in front. And we want to provide opportunities for the many, not just the few. And we want to ensure that all our people are contributing to this. And what are they contributing to? They're contributing to innovation. Because without innovation, we're not going to see the realization of these tremendous opportunities and the scientific revolutions <clears throat> and the consensus that's growing in our, in our world that we have to deal with these big problems. So I want to give you a definition of innovation. And it's I to the fifth power. Innovation is the intersection of ideas, imagination, insight, invention, and impact. And it's all about I, the human being. So a few things that are very significant that, again, came out in the discussions. One, productivity matters. Productivity for economic growth is at the centerfold. And I just got a little text during the meeting. I thought it was interesting. California has returned to the fifth largest economy in the world. Why? Unbelievable productivity gains, not just in the IT and software and intangible, but in agriculture, in housing, in energy, the whole thing and the workforce, tremendous productivity. Most of the world is stranded right now with very low productivity. So what are the drivers of next generation productivity? Well, it's going to be in the talented people, it's going to be in the use and harnessing of technology. It's going to be in smart, creative investments and infrastructure and in integrating all of those things. Digitization, just at the start of it. Advanced manufacturing, again, transforming the whole production system. And interestingly, advanced manufacturing, smart manufacturing, is really emerging back in the developed world in a big way. The study that the US Council did with Deloitte, only two countries in Europe had a future in advanced manufacturing, the UK and Germany, how they're marshalling those assets. So productivity and innovation at the top of the game. Now, I have to talk about trade. Um, the conventional wisdom, and part of this is the political narrative, is that the United States has become a protectionist country. And I want to try in two minutes to dispel that and use facts. And you can Google all these facts and go to the source. So for certainly in the post-World War II period, there has been no country in the world that has been out on the forefront of trade liberalization as the United States. And Frank mentioned you know, my career in the US government. I worked on those issues for many, many years through multilateral rounds, et cetera, the creation of the WTO and all of that. And the post-World War II system created the WTO. And the system is rules-based. It's a governance system. So a very important question is, are the rules 
being implemented? Are they being ignored? Are they being enforced? The global trading system is a rules-based system. And there are very serious penalties in it for bad behavior. What's the bad behavior? It's dumping. It's predatory pricing. It's theft of intellectual property. It's forced technology transfer. And the list goes on and on. So without going into much detail, I can tell you that in the, in, in, from the US perspective, there's great concern that the rules are not being enforced, and the balance is moving against a rules-based system. So I want to just share, again, a few things on tariffs. Does anybody want to tell me what the tariffs are for US cars coming into Europe versus European cars coming in the United States? Does anybody know the numbers? So 10% duties on any US car going into Europe, 2.5% coming into the US. Look at the WTO chart on most favored nation tariffs. The US is at the bottom of the list in terms of putting those on, 2.5%. I hate to say this, um, but India has a 100% tariff on Harley Davidson motorcycles, 100%. So what I want to propose, very radical, Let's get rid of tariffs, because they're really irrelevant now with the global supply chains and moving to this new economy. Let's get rid of tariffs. And that would be a really game-changing global commitment, and we can see where that takes us. Um, finally, I want to talk a little bit about security, because cities, nations, people have to be safe, they have to be busy, and they have to be secure. And on the issue of human dignity and jobs, the most important data that comes out of the Gallup Corporation is what do people want more than anything in the world? What gives them hope? Two things, that they have a job with dignity and they think their life for their children will be better. So the dignity of work is something that we need to elevate at the highest level. On security, Cyberspace is a very dangerous place. None of the uh, IT leaders talked that much about cybersecurity. I know there was a session on it. But let me convey this. The next generation of tools and technologies to deal with cyber will be in the hardware, not in the software. And quantum computing, blockchain's a piece of it. But we have to ensure that the cyber universe is safe, it's resilient, and it's being used for its proper purposes, not for the dark activities. <clears throat> I would rank cybersecurity attacks as the highest risk in the world. And it is going on everywhere. I'm not going to name nations, but it's connected to IP theft. And it has to be addressed. So finally, I want to talk about ethics. Just a few comments on ethics. Um, there are universal values. There are universal ethics about how children should be treated how women should be treated. We know what they are. And we have large swaths of our globe where there is not the implementation of ethics for the dignity of being a human being. And I think without that, we're not going to see reaping the rewards, the benefits of these technological transformations, and that we all have to come together, really, to advance ethical leadership. Finally, I want to say, that in life, there are kind of two components of activity. The ancient Greek golden mean and the golden rule. Reciprocity is a very important word. word. If I come to Horasis every year and every year and enjoy Frank's hospitality and never reciprocate, he's going to say, Deborah, I don't want you to come anymore. <laughs> so reciprocity, fairness, the golden mean, meaning balance, and do unto others as they would have us do unto them. That's all part of how we have to get to this new world. So I'll leave you with a quote from um, a great naval commander in the United States, John Paul Jones, who said, it's an exorable fact of life. Without risk, there's no reward. And I know everyone's here that's a risk taker, but let's go forward and create the rewards from this new transformation into the 21st century. Thank you. Thank you.
Thanks so much, uh, Deborah. I think it's a whole plan, it's a whole vision, and uh, if you would all take your wisdom uh, in our daily work and uh, the government's work, our business, uh, in, uh, in our families, I think the world would definitely be a better place. You called on ethical leadership and uh, maybe mentioning also a void of ethical leadership nowadays. Do we need a new moral compass and how can we, you know, get into it? How can we really create this new um, compass which should be, in a way, you know, uh, followed by everybody? Not just the dream and the vision, but really like, you know, down to earth, say, you know, that's where we sh what we should do. And I think, you know, the concept of, you know, Richard Brockel um, uh, and, you know, mutual understanding, saying, you know, we, we should always respect each other and abandon the Machiavellian mindset. I think that's the way to go. I think, actually, ethical leadership should probably be a sustainable development goal. But it's complex. Um, even in the United States, well, particularly the United States, where we have, in many cases now, an environment where certain ideas are not being expressed, they're being suppressed on our university campuses, which I think is very dangerous. A university president from a very major global university asked me to do an interview on leadership and institutions of leadership, because the US Council on Competitiveness is nonpartisan. We played a huge role in this. I'm very proud we just won the uh, national award for public service last week. It was a very big deal. But I brought up ethical leadership in this President said, well, whose ethics are you talking about? Is it Judeo Judaic Christian? Is it Buddhist? Is it Asian? What are the ethics? And that's why I'm posing, are there some universal values? Here's an example. We now have the capacity through the CRISPR technology to edit every component of human life. We have no compact of ethics of how to do that. And it's going to have profound implications for us as human beings. So I do think we have to have groups like Horasis. I think there are others, the Global Federation of Competitiveness Councils that you're part of and that I'm the president of, and to really look at these things. Because at the end of the day, companies can move anywhere, and they're going to invest and build value where people are good and where they're doing the right thing for the planet, and they have purpose. And ethics are at the heart of that. Absolutely. <laughs> Lila, what are your key takeaways? Well, um, it's been a phenomenal three days. And I think one of the most interesting part about um, being here is how diverse the group, uh, uh, the group of people is here. Um, I think we live in um, building on this concept of what is ethical. Uh, I think we fundamentally live in a time uh, where uh, we have to think of ourselves as human beings differently. Uh, we transformed from uh, the planet that was inhibited by small tribes of people to uh, um, small societies, to nations and kingdoms, to large countries, and now we're truly becoming global. We're one system, we're one organ organism. The actions of one affect the livelihood of somebody who we don't even know. We are, um, we are no longer a set of individual minds. We are, we are a joint organism where if one piece of it is hurting, it hurts the entire body. And I think if we start thinking of ourselves as this interconnected, uh, it's becoming so readily apparent that we need to think more outside of our own minds or just outside of our own heads and think about empathy and think about dignity and think about the choices that we make and the effects that we create. And it is in forums like these that we're actually able to experience it, to hear it, to touch it, to touch the, and, and to feel the responsibility that we have towards each other. And I think if we have that, that is the first step towards making the change that we want to see in the world, the famous Gandhi's words. I think at the same time, we live at an incredible time in terms of technology and opportunity. So if we look at things, yes, we have phenomenal technology, medical technology. We're now we are going to be able to extend our lifespan. We don't even know how long, right? Between, between CRISPR, between being able to uh, 3D print our own organs, 
what's going to happen? We can live now forever, okay, fantastic. Now, AI gives us an opportunity to really predict the future. We can collect the data, we can understand the past, and now we can look into it towards, uh, towards what's to come. And then finally, we have the, uh, the physical technologies to improve, to, to, to interact differently with our planet. We can actually rebuild the planet to, to be healthier. Now we, we can actually take the step, step, step backwards and not fully erase, but at least uh, mitigate the damages that were created in the last century. Right? We're uh, at, a, at a border of being able to utilize carbon that is in, in the atmosphere and create new materials with it. So it's a fascinating time, but at the same time, these incredible advances are also having the dark side that we really need to pay attention to. And the dark side is this widening gap of inequality. Phenomenally, some of us will maybe, may be able to live forever, and yet there are countries in the world where the differences in lifespan is over 30 years now. We used to only be able to live as human beings like just a few centuries ago, only 30 years. Now it's the difference between one country and another. Uh, education, our ability to learn, the knowledge that should, should be available to everyone. We're talking about the next generation, the, that, that represents at least, the, Generation Z represents 25% of the population on the planet. Well, in the session in, uh, on, on Africa's competitiveness, I heard that more than half, half of children who do not go to school, who do not have access to education, live in Africa. That is staggering. What do we expect to happen when these children grow up? What kind of opportunities are they going to have? How do we expect not to have migration, not to have wars? And then, uh, then finally, you know, the resources that we all have. We need to have just to survive as a biological life form. Air, water, the, this planet that we live on. Again, it's unequally distributed today. So how do we address this, this uh, this incredible gap that is just, just beginning to widen. How do we avoid the, the possible uh, breakdown that usually happens when uh, two different periods in the life cycle of our planet or our society happens, right? The big wars or the famines or um, that, that we are starting to see, right? So the cataclysmic events, events that are happening during, uh, because of the, of the climate change. In, my, in, in what we're hearing here is that we need to come together as a society, both as individuals, so we need to open our minds and we need to connect as individuals, but also as, uh, as countries. So we are becoming, as, as we're talking about, we're becoming this post country concept society, where we really need to connect and we really need to come together as, as states, um, as well as the businesses. So we need to connect the business side and the government side. And this is one of the things that we find that is incredibly important, because the actions of the states, the actions of the governments, really affect how businesses behave and operate, but without the business, we cannot, we cannot achieve anything. So I think we need to, from, from the perspective of how we see the world, we need to agree that there are new funda or existing fundamental human rights that are universal for the planet. I think that's, that's what we, uh, we, we hear here as well. And those rights include, when we talk about dignity, it includes giving people health care universally. It includes giving people access to knowledge universally, uh, and it includes clean planet, protecting our habitat universally, because all of us are connected. So how do we do that? And again, going back to history, how do we connect the state and, uh, uh, and the business? When we look at the terrible devastation that happened after the World War II, uh, in Europe, <clears throat> an incredible amount of funds got poured into reconstruction, into, uh, the, into rebuilding uh, Europe uh, post-war. 
I think without, uh, what, I think what's coming out today is that without that level of commitment and investment into reconstructing our planet, in some areas just constructing it, like uh, uh, in, in Africa we still have people without access to energy uh, or access to information. Without pouring that level of investment in, in infrastructure, rebuilding the infrastructure globally, we're going to continue to widen the gap and we're going to create an, uh, an issue where we create a cataclysmic event on, on the planet. So we need a new agreement, a sort of a new deal, that's what it, it was called uh, back then, uh, where th that works on two levels. It works on the way that we understand each other and the way we understand dignity and the way we cooperate. But it also works in a very direct way to invest in areas around the world to to invest in, in infrastructure and to rebuild it to have a healthier planet and a more equitable world. So that's... Thank you, Lila. I think um, your applause and a wonderful summary. I like the idea of a new deal, and you mentioned, Lila, that we see a gulf between, you know, um, uh, all the advances, the optimism, you know, the, the stock exchanges rising and uh, so much, you know, for optimism in the economy. On the other hand, uh, we see just the contrary, you know, in poor countries and even within society we see this gulf. We see basically two dreams, um, in a way two American dreams, uh, the, the topic before, but I think worldwide, you know, we, you know, two European dreams, two African dreams, there's always a, a winner and maybe somebody who, who's struggling. So how can we achieve this new deal? How can we get into like the win-win mentality uh, very practically? Yeah, I think two things have to come together. And I think we have an incredible opportunity to do this with the Sustainable Development Goals. We have an idea where people are actually, people are getting behind those. They want in their hearts and the spirit of, of, of the goals, I, I believe, is touching a lot of people in, uh, across the world. Now, how do we actually materialize the good intent into the real, real change? That's one of the things that we work on in Terawatt. We try to understand that. And what we believe is we need to create this cross-functional cooperation between the governments who want to do the right thing and are willing to come together and work together to create this, and the businesses who are need, which are needed to, to come in and, and build this new world. So when we look at this, uh, to, to enable that, we need the funding and we need the capabilities. We have a lot of capabilities around the world. We do need education to continue to build that, those, that, those capabilities. On the other side, we need funds. It's, it's financing. So we estimate that the sustainable development goals are trillions of dollars. Where are those dollars going to come from? Actually, sovereign states, oftentimes, they don't have that amount of money, especially if we're looking at areas that are most, most affected. Right? So what do we do here? At the same time, we have more than $10 trillion sitting in accounts that are either at zero or negative return. This is the money that is just parked out there. That's, mm. that's so great. somebody here mentioned um, green, green bonds. It's not just green bonds. Thank you. It's not just green bonds. We need to find a way to invest that money into the new economy, into the new deal. How do we do that? We need to create a hybrid model where we can create, basically create loans that are securitized and then securitize them at high volume, high transaction volume. It has been done in the past. It, it happens in many areas, right? In the, in the market has a, has a modality for this, but it, has not, it hasn't yet adapted to what we need to do now. So we need to come together to build the market between the public institutions and governments and the private investors mm -hmm. to connect the dots, to create the vehicles, including the, bo the bond is one vehicle, but we, there are many types of asset, uh, asset securities that can, be, can enable us to invest trillions of dollars into sustain what, what is effectively the mission behind sustainable development goals. Because that money is going to pay us back manyfold. 
It's not something that needs to be a donation. At the end of the day, this money will grow GDPs of, of these countries significantly, and they will pay back. Rajiv, would you like to comment on our two co-chairs? Yeah, Maybe. well, uh, I was wanting to actually ask a question, if mm -hmm. I may, Frank, with your permission. Uh, tell me, um, why is uh, impact investments uh, not going into this area then? You know, on one hand, we have $10 trillion sitting in the banks, earning either no or very, or negative interest. Yep. And on the other hand, you have now this new generation of young people we talked about earlier, uh, who are getting into impact investments well, why are they not getting into this? Great and really important question. So um, somebody mentioned in one of the sessions that the economy that we live in today is set up for the last, uh, last century. And uh, it takes time for the economy to transition. So the, the operation of the market today is set up, set up for the carbon-based economy. So the vehicles, for example, for, for financing, buying, selling, le loaning, pricing risk, for, for those vehicles exist today. For the new technologies, they do not exist. For the new countries, they don't exist. For example, if you have a project in uh, Congo versus the project in San Francisco, I can price and loan you money for a project of San Francisco like that because it's been done a million times. Now, the project in Congo, I don't know what the political risk is going to look like, what is uh, inconvertibility risk is going to look like. All of these things just have not been done at scale. So the first piece of that is structuring the market so that it makes it easy for people to, do the, to, to make those investments. Because most of the investors, they don't look at individual deal. They invest trillion dollars, right? Maybe not trillion, but they, look, they invest millions of dollars at once. And the, the work required to understand the risks, to understand the vehicle, and then ultimately to, we need, a, we need some level of de-risking, and this is where the governments can really help. They, they can create ways to ensure effectively, which is what US government does internally, ensure the risk when the risk is perceived too high initially. United States government does it for security deposits of individuals. But at they fairly do low for, rate. At very low rate. But it's at the beginning of the market, you have to do that because the market is too new and the risk is not well understood. In Africa, for example, the, risk, uh, the, uh, the perceived risk of investing in African countries is very high. What seems to be the reality is that it's very far from what, what, uh, what really is happening. So the real risk is not nearly as high as we think it is. We've had that experience in India. You know, but, but and it's getting better. That, it's getting much not better. Not much better. It's, it's, it's fantastic. Uh, India has been the highest recipient of foreign direct investment for the last two years for greenfield new projects. Yes. I mean, so but that's good. also because... And my apologies for the Harley Davidsons. I love them. <laughs> and I can't afford them, all right? But when I come to the Somebody US, can. I'll hire them and I'll drive them, all right? Because they're they terrific just need bikes. They to make them green. They, but, but... <laughs> Electric. Uh, I mean, I've got to defend my country. Give me one moment. Give me one back. We, we allow uh, foreign news channels to come in and invest as startup. USA, I don't know why, doesn't. I mean... If the existing ones are lying, the new ones perhaps will also lie, or may speak the truth, I don't know. But whatever, you know. And uh, there are one or two other areas. For example, a critical area is defense. In India today, if you're bringing in high technology on par, you're allowed 100% foreign direct investment, 100. And without any questions asked, 40% for defense manufacturing in India as foreign direct investment. Why do you think that is? Hmm? Why do you think they've singled out defense? Giving those I think you, you because of production jobs, yeah. right? But in that particular sector. Yeah, because we want we want to sort of. Because uh, I, I would just say it, because it's a big it's a big uh, big area of uh, creation of jobs, and it's a very good export order, and then it gives you kind of geopolitical leverage in the years ahead. Yeah. But well, it's it not just sense. defense, actually. Uh, India just last year uh, got its first unicorn, what it's called. So unicorn is a startup that is valued at a billion dollars or more. <laughs> right? And the, last year, uh, India got, I think, multiple ones for the first time. Which, and the reason for that is, again, the investment is flowing into the startup market, and it's international investment. That is, you're right. We, we are doing very well in, in but, the startup economy. But I would economy. just say India's done a superb job in dealing with some of the laws, the regulatory environment, 
you know, governance, getting rid of corruption that has made investors and not and allowing talent. Trump to uh, levy heavy sanctions on us or Let's counter maybe, sanctions. Um, <laughs> open up the, if of, India's a great <laughs> example, of course. Sorry and, about uh, what that. What you do in India is fantastic, of course. You know, demonetization, for example, and you know, uh, trying to um, uh, drive back corruption, for example, in the whole black market. We got a session on black markets here at the summit. Before we sum up, I will ask you in a minute. You know, like. Uh, uh, a very, you know, um, hell of a summary, maybe in three words, and what you would like to leave with the audience. Maybe just maybe three or four comments from the audience. No questions, just very quick comments on what our distinguished panel just laid out to you. Any um, last comments, maybe um, on a very high note? Uh, I think there was one before here. Could you have the, uh, the microphone? But commenting on what we said. You see, Frank, this is Martin Hammond. You give me a tricky situation because I ask before, how do I comment? That I'll tweak it around and still make it work. The, the discussions we all had was also about innovation between startups and corporates. And I, I would wish to see discussions, because especially, I'm not worrying about Europe or US per se, collaborative innovation between startups and corporates, but I'm, wor I'm worrying more in other emerging markets where the corporates don't have the experience that the Western world has. So if ever we could have, not one, but even in other harassing sessions, in this session, bringing the notion that Corporates, please treat the startups like equal partners right. and not That's like big boys, point. small boys. It's a very key question That's because good. you know what? The big boys will lose their shirt after tomorrow, eat them up, and then they're buying by the small ones. So if we can have those kinds of sessions, and that brings the younger generation also onto the panel that was requested. I really like that one too. So. Good comment. I think we write already the program for next year's summit. <laughs> Getting more ideas. Uh, yes, Thank we you. have uh, uh, one more comment here in the center. Uh, right here. Now a lot right of hands go up. Okay, okay, good. So uh, this is actually for Deborah. Uh, Deborah, I think you're absolutely correct that borders have to fall. We live in a global society, and your comment about borders have to remove the tariffs and all that, including the borders, is a up great opportunity for the world to come together utilizing the technology. My, my actual comment is about the governments. Governments always the laggards in the technology, it doesn't matter what government you ask, you know, India, it doesn't matter where they are. The question is, in the level where you are as a head of US competitiveness office, is how do we get governments to get out of the way? Because the more rules we create, the more loopholes, the more abuses, the more corruption we create. So how can we remove the government? How can we make government smaller and richer at the same time? Thank you. So maybe deregulation as uh, yeah. the buzzword. Yes. Smart regulation. Smart regulation. Yeah. Good point. We have um, two more comments. Maybe final comments. One in the center, and then one to you. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, Frank and the panelists and everyone else for a wonderful few days. It's been a fantastic experience. Um, and uh, we we live in a very competitive world. Uh, everything is about competition. Is companies. Com compete for money, countries compete for money within countries, uh, one region uh, uh, competing with another. But there's something that, to me, kind of uh, is above our heads, is like a cloud, which is inequality. And uh, you mentioned inequality. Uh, I, I think almost every single session that I, that I uh, watched mentioned inequality in one way or another. So for me, I think if there's one message, uh, to us all is that we should try and do everything that we can in our areas and everything that we said that we would like to do to improve anything that we, we need to be improved, but to have that idea of fighting inequality because in a world in which we have like some continents back there and some other continents much more developed, it's going to be very difficult to achieve a more collective, uh, 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 to, 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 to change the world more collective, collectively for everyone else. Thank Great. you. Great. Good point. Uh, last comment. Well, um, this is my first um, attendance at the Harassus Global Meeting, and I thank you for this. Um, it's been tremendously insightful, and you've not only been an excellent moderator, but also a most gracious host. So I'm sure everyone would join in. Thank you. Thank you. 
Um, I, I come from a background where, I, I mean, I'm not from a business background, but I work in this field of defense and security and geopolitical developments. And um, I think my comment w is related to Miss um, Wynne-Smith's Deborah. comment, Deborah, uh, her comment about security. And I think you were alluding more to economic security of individuals in countries. But I think we also see a generally deteriorating um, broader uh, security context that we also need to be cognizant of. And I was wondering whether it might actually be possible, because I'm in, in about a month, I'm going to be attending the Shangri-La Dialogue, where I think the prognosis is far more bleak. Um, and, and since developments are going to all be taking place in this broader geostrategic context, I think it might be useful to have a conversation, a greater conversation between the two communities where the optimism of the Harassus Global Meeting is transferred across to some of these bleaker um, uh, uh, outlooks and where some of the caution or the cautionary tales from, from the security defense community might be brought into this to also highlight the challenges that might be facing some of the ideas and the innovations that this community is generating. Thank you. Thank you. Great comment. Thank you. So we come to the end. Uh, so we'd like to ask our three panelists for a very short, um, crispy summary, maybe in two or three words, uh, like the key takeaway, the key notion of uh, what we would like to leave to our wonderful audience. Deborah. Uh, I'll just give three words. Maybe four. OK. All right. <laughs> um, productivity, inclusive growth, innovation, ethics. I think the last point is very important, <laughs> ethics. Thank you. Lila. I'll tell you a short story. Um, back in the day when, uh, when I was running uh, the Wikimedia Foundation, I was in not running, in charge of the Wikimedia Foundation, uh, and um, I used to have a conversation with editors. You know, you all know Wikimedia. It's written by people all over the world. Uh, and uh, in the early days, uh, each article was just written by one person. And then more and more people get on, came online, and they started sharing the space. They started all commenting and, and changing each other's text, and it get really, really frustrating. And, uh, and now it's the probably most valuable resource for primary knowledge in the world. And um, this editor, it was a woman, she said, you know, after a while, we just got forced to collaborate. So the one message I, I, I am living with here is that even if we're forced to, we must collaborate with each other. No matter where we are, or who we are, or what we believe in, we must find a way to collaborate. Thanks, Lida. Rajiv. Well, uh, Frank, uh, can I ask you a question? You oh. may like to announce the dates oh, of, okay, the, of good, next good, year's good. meeting <laughs> to begin with. OK, you know. good, good. So yeah, I want to make actually a few announcements. Uh, first of all, um, thanking everybody. I think a wonderful audience. And we are all here to jointly inspire the future and shape the future. We have seen the optimism here. I think. Um, we have to beat the naysayer, so to say, and uh, we need this optimism. Of course, we see emerging risks, and we talked about those risks, um, geopolitical risk and uh, even technological risk. but we have to use technology to make this place, uh, this world a better place to live on. Uh, on the announcements, uh, and um, maybe starting for, for next year, uh, the, the meeting will be held again in Kashkais, and I would like to thank actually the government of Portugal the city of Kashkais for hosting us. And we would like to have Kashkais as a permanent location for this Rasa global meeting. And next year's meeting will be held on the 29th of March to the 2nd of April. 29th of March to the 2nd of April, again in Kashkais. Welcome everybody to join. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> now, are your announcements over? Or are uh, any not more? yet, not yet. Oh, but maybe, maybe come, you can see no, a few no, words. Yeah, sure, ahead, sure, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A very practical announcement. Of course, the summit is still not over. There's a lavish dinner waiting for us just downstairs. So um, for all those who would like to celebrate and for those all who want to eat and to drink and uh, to meet, continue the discussions, please join us for the dinner. And I'm told it's the best caterer. The best in caterer in Kais. Portugal, exactly. In, or Portugal, I'm not sure. So, <laughs> right? and, exactly. And Frank uh, said that there'll be a little bit of music and dancing towards the end. Yeah, 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 so exactly. It. So, so for all those who would like to but dance. Frank, one minute before we have a good time. <laughs> we've had over 70 sessions, over three days. We've had 600 leaders, global leaders, in various fields, political, business, uh, uh, religious and uh, many, many other uh, academicians from the world over. 
and it's been terrific. I think already people have thanked you for it, but I think let's collectively thank you. Thank you. And of course, for Racist and the lovely team. Thank you. And thanks, of course, to all of you. Thank you. Thanks. And you know, wonderful rapporteur, wonderful co chairs, wonderful audience. One very last uh, announcement. Tomorrow, we continue, of course, 8 o'clock for the last round of sessions. And then we will discover Kashkais. We have actually a, a sightseeing waiting at 11.30. We go to the old city of Kashkais. So please enjoy the evening. Thank you.